I've entitled the sermon this afternoon, The Consequence. The Consequence, and I hope that by the time we get uh, to the end of the sermon, we will have a keener understanding of how particular ways of living lead to certain consequences inevitably. On June 26, five lawyers on the Supreme Court issue what will likely go down as the most sweeping social change and redefinition of liberty and constitutional rights in the history of our country. Here is the essence of the uh, Supreme Court majority opinion. Quote, the Constitution promises liberty to all within its reach, a liberty that includes certain specific rights that allow persons within a lawful realm to define and express their identity. The petitioners in these cases seek to find that liberty by marrying someone of the same sex and having their marriages deemed lawful on the same terms and conditions as marriages between persons of the opposite sex. Now that is an extraordinary statement in many respects. A redefinition not only of marriage but also of constitutional rights, rights that according to some commentators I think have rightly been uh, defined as having been invented. It is impossible to predict the consequence entirely of the impact that this is going to have on us as individuals, as me as a business owner, for example, and as a church. The contradiction of terms and the license taken with logic, natural law, and historical precedent by the majority opinion is as frightening as it is astonishing. And this fact did not escape the the, the justices who wrote the dissent. So allow me to get a little bit technical, but I think it's important to um, understand the consequence of what we are facing. Here's what Judge Justice Roberts said, quote, the majority's decision is an act of will, not legal judgment. Now that, that is a, an extremely interesting statement when you have the Supreme Court acting out of will instead of making a legal judgment. The right it announces has no basis in the Constitution or this court's president. This is the Chief Justice writing about his own court. As a result, the court invalidates the marriage laws of more than half the states and orders the transformation of a social institution that has formed the basis of human society for millennia. Justice Scalia, I kind of like to read his opinions because they are notoriously, shall we say, blistering or uh, colorful. But what really astounds in, is the hubri reflected in today's traditional, judicial putsch. The five justices who comp compose today's majority are entirely comfortable concluding that every state violated the Constitution for all of the 135 years between the 14th Amendment ratification and Massachusetts permitting of same-sex marriage in 2003. Now, when, when we, what is astonishing is how fast things have changed. Massachusetts got out ahead even of Holland and Scandinavia and other uh, socially liberal countries to be the first place in the world where you could legally marry as a same-sex couple. That was 2003. That's 12 years ago. Continuing. They have discovered in the 14th Amendment, quote, a fundamental right overlooked by every person alive at the time of ratification and almost everyone else since then. And then he goes on to enumerate some of the most brilliant legal minds in the history of our country who this has escaped their notice. The justices, quote, know 
that limiting marriage to one man and one woman is contrary to reason. They know that an institution as old as government itself and accepted by every nation in history until 15 years ago cannot possibly be supported by anything other than ignorance or bigotry. And they are willing to say that any citizen who does not agree with that, who adheres to what was until 15 years ago, the unanimous judgment of all generations and all societies stands against the Constitution. You know, this is not uh, some radical individual writing. This is one of the justices of the United States of America, arguably any and all of them are brilliant people. Here's what Justice Thomas said. The court's decision today is at odds not only with the Constitution, but with the principles upon which our nation was built since well before 1787, 1787 liberty has been understood as freedom from government action, not entitlement to government benefits. The framers created our Constitution to preserve that understanding of liberty, yet the majority invokes our Constitution in the name of a liberty that the framers would not have recognized to the detriment of the liberty they, to the detriment of the liberty they sought to protect. Along the way, it rejects the idea, captured in our Declaration of Independence, that human dignity is innate and suggests instead it comes from the government. This distortion of our Constitution not only ignores the text, it inverts the relationship between the individual and the state in our republic. I cannot agree with it. One of the um, blogs that I read or, or news blurbs that I read this week, um, an individual, an activist took uh, Justice Thomas to task about his commentary about the innate um, the innate um, human dignity that human dignity rather is innate that something everybody has no matter um, who they are and he pointed out that even slaves while the government allowed them to be enslaved still had this innate human dignity. And someone was able to take that and twist it to, um, uh, it, to say that Justice Thomas, who is African American, is a clown with a black face. Now why do I, why do I bring this up, aside from the fact that it is a tremendous social change that is going to affect everything as we have know it, known it. Let me give you a quote from a um, philosopher named uh, Francis Schaeffer. Quote, today not only in philosophy, but in politics, government, and individual morality, our generation sees solutions in terms of synthesis and not absolutes. When this happens, truth as people have always thought of truth has died. We live in a society in which everybody has an opinion. Now, that is not something new. That's part of the human condition. Everybody's had an opinion. I remember so well in Big Sandy, um, Mr. Stolle said, opinions are like belly buttons. Everybody's got one. But we are now at a point in which people sincerely believe or have been deceived to believe that all opinions are somehow equal. And that's just simply not the case. Schaefer's words, I believe, have proven to be prophetic except, except that truth itself is not dead. Perhaps we could express it this way. The belief in absolute truth may be dead, while the belief in moral relativism where everyone's opinion is equally right has become the predominant guiding principle of the day. The belief in truth may be dead, 
But truth, by its very definition, is immutable. And in a church of God, more than anywhere else, we have used the term in that way. When did you come to know the truth? And whenever we refer to that, we're talking about understanding and learning by definition what tr the truth of God really is and how it differentiates us from others in the nominal Christian world. Truth doesn't change. I mean, if, if we change our understanding of truth, it means one of two things. Either what, what our understanding had been was not true, or what we now understand is closer to the truth. The truth itself is neither dead nor is it able to be changed. Otherwise, it wouldn't be truth. In, in the um, opinion, I, wrote, I read all 100 pages of it. <laughs> And um, it is an interesting read. I would encourage everybody to read it if you are so inclined. But as I mentioned earlier, as we might expect, the nine chief justices, not nine chief justices, the nine justices on the Supreme Court, you would expect them to be uh, highly educated individuals. And what struck me as I read the majority opinion was how they appealed to such words as equality, liberty, fundamental human rights, um, and they very articulately used those terms in a way that sounds so good. But it's just wrong. The reason we know that is because we know the Bible. You know, liberty and happiness is a wonderful thing to enjoy, but it is a result of right living, not a principle to define the right way to live. Truth, on the other hand, is not the result of right living. Rather, it remains the immutable principle to define it. I was struck by a passage a number of months ago back in 2 Corinthians chapter, three verse, uh, chapter 13, verse 8. Paul wrote in his second letter to the Corinthians this, and I'm just quoting the excerpt. For we can do nothing against the truth, but for the truth. That should be a very encouraging uh, scripture for us today. No matter what some Supreme Court states or whatever judicial decree or the result of countless lawsuits that may be decided in a manner that we would disagree with, none of that is going to be able to change the fact that marriage is between a man and a woman because it's the truth and it's not my purpose today to provide a, a legal analysis on the deficiencies of the court's majority opinion but rather why their ruling should not have come as a surprise it is something that should not have a surprise that it is the consequence of a long series of events that led us to this place. What happened just a week ago was a long time in coming and comes as a natural consequence of something more fundamental than even marriage itself. The Apostle Paul gives us some insight. Let's go over to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, I'm going to read verse 28 first of all, and then um, we will look at how Paul got to that particular statement. Romans chapter 1, in verse 28, we read this, And even as they did not retain God in their knowledge... God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting. 
Now, it's interesting that this comes on the heels of having described some of the relationships that are now a constitutional right, and just before describing other behaviors that are inconsistent with the truth of God. The question is, and what I want to point out here, is the singular cause that started the process is taking God out of the picture. Now, human beings down through time have believed in God or gods or um, some sort of higher being, and depending on where you put it in history, and again, this is kind of a, a floating target, perhaps um, towards the end of the 19th century, when um, Darwin's theory of, theory of evolution became um, prominent among, among academia, perhaps somewhere in that time we as a country began to dispense with God in a certain way. Um, and um, that changes, that changes a dyna that changes a dynamic and, un un uh, and, and, and unleashes a sequence of events that have come to where we are at today. So let's take a look at this progression. I was struck some time ago as I read Romans chapter 1 on the sequential nature of the passage that uh, Paul is writing here. And uh, it, it, it shows a series of events that very closely coincide with our history over the past hundred years. And one of, th one of the things I always um, want to point out here is that, you know, Paul is writing to the Romans, or the Christians in Rome, and he didn't have what we have taken for granted, something called constitutional rights. Yes, he was a Roman citizen, and he had certain rights, but in, in, he did not have uh, constitutional rights in the way that we have enjoyed them up until now. And uh, I think we're about to see a sea change in that. That did not prevent Paul, the most prolific writer of the New Testament, to state things explicitly and clearly so that there can be no mistake. Notice what, what he writes in verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. Paul in Rome was not ashamed, even though he was at times imprisoned and chained to speak boldly, even though he did not have a constitutional right to do so. And um, I think we will be faced with the same type of um, choices individually, collectively as a church, and um, I'm hoping that we will not be ashamed. I mean. There are a number of passages in the scripture that don't talk positively at all about being ashamed of Jesus Christ. And we have individual opportunities to do that. And it's always, I mean, it, it, it is a, a balance. I mean, I, I face it frequently in my job. You know, on the one hand, you don't want to be um, solicitous. And on the other hand, um, you, you, the, the balance is where, where, do you, um, where does the balance fall from being ashamed to being in your face? And I think that is, that is something that each individual has to decide for themselves. I think um, for me the answer is to be authentic. Be who you are. Most people go through life trying to be someone. They're not and ending, ending up wasting a lot of time uh, in the process. You know, be someone. Well, be, why not be yourself? <laughs> it, it helps. And, and I think we can, you can always learn from the opposition. And the lesson I think that we can learn from, quote, the opposition in the uh, walk towards equality and the question of um, um, same-sex marriage in particular is the fact that um, a very small majority that is engaged can make a big difference. They are not ashamed. They are not ashamed. They're out of the closet. They are loud. And um, I think one valid criticism of the Christian community has been that 
we have not been out and speaking out in the way that we should have been, otherwise um, we would not be where we're at today. We can't blame, the Christian community cannot blame um, the liberals for the fact that over half of evangelical millennium, millennials support same-sex marriage. Oh yes, these individuals were inf influenced by the, uh, the world, but apparently the church, in quotes, did a bad job of teaching them. Because studies also show that parents and the church still are primary influencers in people's lives. So, Paul, what we see here is, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. And notice what it says, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. There is an inherent power in the gospel of Jesus Christ that should empower us to go forward and demonstrate why this is the right way to live and use words if necessary, if you know what I'm saying. It is, we, we have, I believe, and this is John Miller's opinion, which is usually worth five cents if you give me a nickel change. Um, in my short life, what I have concluded is to the extent that I am able to somehow, even imperfectly, live the principles of the Bible, it brings positive results. And there's no, I mean, marriage is an extreme example of that. And to redefine marriage to something that is completely unnatural is just not going to have good results. That is um, predictable. Continuing in verse 18, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Our academia and our world has suppressed truth. Because if you notice, because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. There is... You know, you, you, you move away from the belief in a God, and then you move away from what was considered what was considered self-evident truth on July the 4th, 1776, to the point where we believe instead of being created by a benevolent higher being for a specific purpose, to be the cosmic accident of natural processes and here we are and this is all it is. It changes how you react, it changes how you live your life. I've met people like that. I have interacted and talked to people. Um, I always uh, say that at Superb Industries we're a very diverse group. We have everybody from Amish to atheist. And that's a pretty broad spectrum. So I have the opportunity to um, interact with a lot of different people. And, and you can tell that if you believe in a creator, I mean, think about it. I'm here by chance. I mean, I'm, I'm somewhere on the cosmic spectrum of billions of years ago heading towards billions of years of unknown so I have to do everything I can to get as much as I can while the getting is good for me myself and I as opposed to believing that I'm here for a purpose because God created me and put me on this earth to learn his way and will and has made it possible through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ to give to me eternal life. It changes everything about how you think and how you order your life. 
And we see it here <clears throat> expressed in Romans chapter 1. Verse 21, and here's, here's the beginning of the consequent, because although they knew God, they did not glorify Him as God, nor were thankful, and became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. You know, how is it that individuals, like we saw uh, in the uh, majority opinion of, on a human level, being extraordinarily brilliant, coming to decisions that make no sense. I mean, the, the idea of finding a constitutional right to marry someone of the same sex in our Constitution would have been unthinkable even 15 years ago. It says here that when we do not retain God in their knowledge, hearts become foolish and filled with darkness. Continuing in verse 22, profess they became fools. You see a progression, as I mentioned, you start with dispensing with God, dispensing Him as your Creator, and, be, and now we, you elevate human reason and human reason absent God is or can be incredibly foolish. I mean anybody that um, understands something about biology, um, reproduction in general, uh, the basics of human anatomy, uh, cannot come to a rational conclusion that same-sex marriage is a natural union. It just, it, it doesn't make any sense and yet um, it is being bantered about as a tremendous step forward on our walk to equality. And th notice, I mean, that is brilliantly framed. It's kind of like back in the, um, in the Garden of Eden. Did God say, you know, just, you know, you, you, you frame things in, in, an away, in a way that is um, intellectually stimulating, and you get people to start thinking in a particular way. Continuing, professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible men and birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Therefore God gave them up to uncleanness in the lusts of their heart to dishonor their bodies among themselves. So here is what in what the inevitable consequence is when you start to look at things in the absence of God's truth. Lust becomes redefined as love. If you would go out and ask people what is love, you would get all kinds of opinions and everybody's got one. But much of what we see today um, expressed as or defined as love is in actuality lusts that are des described here. Therefore God has also, also gave them up to uncleanness in the lusts of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. This is another natural progression. When you dispense with God the creator what happens? You begin to worship the creation. And you say, oh, John, come on. I mean, that's not happening today. Well, hold on for a minute. You know, we have today federal laws protecting, federal laws protecting um, eggs of endangered species. And it's a criminal offense to destroy it. And yet, we have a federal law that also is based on a misinterpretation of the Constitution to give, quote, women the right to choose to kill their offspring. We place more value as a society in some cases 
on the um, ability for endangered quote unquote species to procreate and recreate than we do on human beings. And again, that is the consequence of believing that we are simply another mammal among, other, among others that have um, been able to um, evolve to a higher state. <clears throat> for this reason, God gave them up to vile passions, for even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise, also men, leaving the natural use of women, burned in their lust for another men, with men committing what is shameful, and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error, which was due. This was Rome. This was Paul speaking to his culture that is very similar to the culture of today. But contrary to what Francis Schaeffer said, truth is not dead. You cannot escape the consequence of ignoring God, of being ashamed of the gospel, of rejecting him as your creator, of professing to be wise and then, it, and then expecting to not become foolish. So the question is, in the time that we yet share, what do we do individually to avoid the consequence? I'd like to go over to um, a passage of scripture that I have found to be very encouraging, and that's over in 2 Timothy chapter 1. 2 Timothy chapter 1. And the reason I find this um, encouraging and, and energizing is because <clears throat> here you have Paul the Apostle um, in prison writing to um, Timothy the Evangelist and Timothy was discouraged. It's evident from uh, Paul's writing and Paul gets right to the point. And he writes, Therefore I remind you, verse 6, to stir up the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. This is an extraordinarily powerful scripture because it talks about something that was given to us that enables us to be the opposite of what we read in Romans chapter 1. It is a spirit, not a fear. And we think about it, I mean, fear is part of the human condition. We, you know, we're afraid of different things, but we're, when, when it comes to fear, as I think it was Franklin Delano Roosevelt, they said, there is no fear but fear itself. But for us, brethren, what should we fear? There is nothing to fear when you know the truth. There is something about a power and a love and a sound mind. And what I'd like to do is to ask the question, you know, not to take away the fact that this is the Holy Spirit that is given to us, but what is that essential characteristic of the Spirit that creates the absence of fear? You know, what, what is it about the Holy Spirit that enables us to have a life absent of fear? What is it about the Holy Spirit that provides the source of the power to transform and is the basis for soundness of mind? I go back to the uh, passage back in 2 Corinthians that I mentioned earlier. And um, it tracks back to this whole concept and the importance of truth itself. And in 1 John chapter 5, verse 6, we read this. This is he who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ, not only by water, but by water and blood, and it is the Spirit who bears witness because the Spirit is truth. When I read that, I thought, okay, you know, I've always thought of the Spirit, you know, the helper and, and this, this power from God and all of that is true. 
But here we have the Apostle John writing that the Spirit is truth. And whenever you have that, you know, interesting verb, is, it, he is saying the Spirit by definition is truth. So I went back and I thought, well, what did Jesus Christ say? Well, we find in John chapter 14, verse 15 through 17, he says, Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive. In John chapter 15, verse 26, Christ said, But when the Helper comes, whom I shall send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me. John chapter 16, verse 13, However, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you in all truth. And when you begin to think about that more deeply, I think it follows that it is the truth, the knowledge of the truth that creates the absence of fear. And John chapter 8 verse 32 says, You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. You know, when we faith, when we face death, um, we can do so without fear because we know the truth. Paul the Apostle, not just Paul the Apostle, but Paul and most of the other apostles, save John, could faith the sword and fire and crucifixion and all of those persecutions because they knew the truth. They had lived and walked and understood and seen and experienced the truth that Jesus Christ had given. I am the way, the truth, and the life. The second thing that truth does is truth is the underlying source for the power to transform. Truth is the underlying source for the power to transform. Most people, I think it is safe to say, live in some form of denial of truth. Taken to an extreme when you're an addict and you abuse substances, denial of the truth is fundamental to that condition. You first of all deny it yourself. And anybody that has worked with people in helping them to uh, come out of that understands that until they get to the point where they face the truth of I am an alcoholic, I am, you know, whatever the addiction might be, uh, whatever the sin might be, unless there is a coming to terms with the truth, no transformation can take place. So when Paul wrote to Timothy, and he talks about a spirit, not of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind, the defining characteristic that causes, that, that sparks that, that moves it alone, is the truth. It empowers us. And that's what I, um, why I say it, I think it is so important to, to be ourselves. Most, most everybody else knows it already. They already know who you really are. You know, so don't, don't put up a front because it's usually more obvious to um, other people than it is to ourselves. And that's where change can occur, where, where transformation can take place. And when we track it back to the topic we've been talking about, those who ignore the truth of biology, of natural law, of the divine institution of marriage, come to a very bad place come to a very bad place. The third uh, characteristic um, in soundness of mind, you know, go back to, if we hearken back to, I'm not going to read it, Romans chapter 1, verses 16 through 32. You know, when we ignore the truth of God, it leads to a warped mind. You know, how can, how can someone 
with a sound mind make a comment that Justice Thomas is a clown with a black face based on the opinion that he wrote stating that um, even slaves had human dignity that the government could not take away from them. It is an example of human reasoning gone awry. So where does this leave us? Here's where I think it leaves us. We have no idea today what the full consequences of the court's decision will be. The Council of Elders made a very strong statement on what we have to do, and that is to obey God rather than men. That has always been our calling. Um, our allegiance is, first of all, to the um, um, kingdom of God, and you know we we are not subject to we are ultimately subject to, as the Council of Elders described, the Supreme Court of Heaven. So I challenge all of us to know the truth, and in doing so, that will give us the ability to go forward with confidence with a sound mind and to transform not only our lives but also others. You see, we have a singular opportunity to show the way. You know, we, we spend a lot of time, you know, talking, that's part of uh, the human condition, and even as a church, we spend a lot of time and money proclaiming the gospel. And we've got Mr. McNeely with us today. That's part of his job. And, I know, and in no way do I want to diminish what he is doing. That is something that we have to do. However, I think the, the statement, um, and I'm going to paraphrase, always teach, always preach a sermon, use words if necessary, is incumbent upon us today. We can show the way better than we can teach the way and if we don't show the way, we will end up with suffering the consequences of not living the truth that we have been taught.